All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, we have a big fight card going. BKFC 16 is happening, and Garcia versus Elmore, that top of the marquee attraction for March 19th, a lightweight bout, which you can check out on Fight TV, also available on the Bare Knuckle TV app. We have Leonard Garcia and Joe Elmore towing the line and knuckling up, and I have Leonard making another appearance on the show. How's your day going so far there, man? You're telling me you knocked out a good mitt session and everything. You feeling good with the preparations ahead of this one? Fantastic, man. I know uh, against a guy like Elmore, you need a gas tank and, and, and you need to have some firepower. So I'm getting everything put together for him. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, he's doing the same thing and we'll both uh, meet each other on an equal playing field and get it off. Yeah, and I imagine just based on our last talk and how studious you seem to be with the game and everything, I imagine you're familiar with Joe Elmore and just the 2-0 and record on the BKFC circuit. What are your thoughts on just his style and just, like, I guess his efforts so far in the BKFC ring? You know, Joe, Joe's a definitely a unique individual, and uh, he brings uh, he brings a very unorthodox style. Um, it's, it's really tough to bring guys in to get ready for a guy like Elmore because he doesn't take a, uh, a traditional approach or a boxing approach. He's... Uh, He's kind of a man. He he slugs from every direction, but every hand has power, and uh, he generates power from short distances. So it's a it's a scary fight to prepare for. And uh, you know, I got a I, I've I've watched lots of his tapes, and and I've tried to study him. But like you said, man, he's very unpredictable. So um, you know, I'm just going in, and and uh, you know, I'm trying to get them to throw things at me when I'm sparring to see if I can visualize them coming in and. Uh, I like physically throwing other objects during sparring, um, you know, from, from awkward directions. And if, if they hit me, that could be a shot that I take. So it's, it's a little different, man. You got to prepare differently for every fight. And, um, you know, I hope I'm doing all the right things. And, and I hope you guys see uh, uh, the fruits of it whenever I get in there. Yeah, I get what you're saying, kind of unpredictable. Because even in the two BKFC fights there, he got that finish in you know, less than a minute and the other one going the full distance and just a sustained effort throughout. So you kind of have to just be ready for just anything on the night of the fight, I would guess, eh? That's exactly right. Right now, we're like I said, we're preparing for for anything that comes. You know, they say he tries to hit you with everything, but everything and the kitchen sink. So I I haven't brought any kitchen sinks in, but I'm getting ready for everything else. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and last time out, you had some world champion strikers that were kind of helping you along there, like Brian Bira, I believe you were working with, and Alejandro Martinez as well, and just getting some good looks all around. It also seems like Tom Schof is a guy you've been working with ahead of this one. Like, who are the main sparring partners and guys you're getting in that work with ahead of this fight? Yeah, you know, Tom Schof is a big name. He's he's a guy who, who faced him for the five rounds that, that he went the last time, so... Um, Having Shof, Shof, uh, Shof down here has been uh, a really good mental mental value for me, like a good edge to, to keep on. And he's, you know, he like he told me, you know, everything changes with, with body style and, and, and shape and, and, and different sizes. But he, he kind of had a decent idea of what Elmore uh, was coming with. And, and uh, also, you know, Brian Bear is actually my brother. Um, so uh, uh, him him coming down here, and, and helping out has been a big issue, uh, a, a great big help as well. Um, he's preparing for a fight as well, so um, by, by all of us being in the same fight camp during the same time, it's good because we're both in shape. Um, Shelf is, uh, actually took three days out just to go do uh, specific cardio to get ready, and then uh, he'll be back here this Saturday, and he's staying with me until the end of the fight. So, um you know, all, all the different looks that we're getting is fantastic. And, of course, you know, I've got my local guys here who uh, who aren't professional boxers. They're MMA fighters, and they, they, they bring in a, a different style as well. And um, they study shelf, and, and, and they're really uh, pushing, you know, his, his, uh, his agenda. You know, everybody's coming in there trying to knock my head off. So as long as I keep from getting rattled in the gym, I think I'll be good out there. Yeah, it seems like you and Tom Shove have a good camaraderie beyond just the sparring partner dynamic. Like, I'm pretty sure you guys were framing the bare knuckle four, you know, track suits there, if my memory serves. I, I didn't understand you. I'm sorry. 
Oh, I just seen something about the bare knuckle FC four suits on your Instagram a couple days ago, framing them and kind of adding yeah. them to the collection. Yeah, man, uh, it was kind of cool. We uh, we traded our our uh, our tops out with each other, so he's got he's got my uh, my bottom or my top, and uh, I kept my bottoms in his top. So um, you know, it's kind of a cool memorabilia thing to have, and it just shows the connection between me and Tom, like. Uh, you know, memorabilia from a fight is a big deal, and uh, the fact that we're able to trade that off and kind of make it, uh, uh, you know, unify one of the one of the suits between two of the guys who competed on it, we thought that was kind of cool. He also gave me the uh, Tom Silk beard comb. Uh, oh, yeah. Since I won't rock the mustache, he gave me a mustache shaped uh, comb <laughs> so I can comb my beard. And uh, you know, he, he's a fantastic guy, man. And and uh, he, he's uh he's one of those guys, man, that, that that's going to be in this sport for a long time. He's still young. He's still got a lot of fight left in him. And, um, you know, I, I feel like uh, I got a couple things to prove to myself. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 at 41 years, um, I still feel like it's an old man sport. I still think uh, us older guys are going to run the game for a little while. So I'm just trying to stay in as long as I can and and uh that was the reason I wanted to fight Joe Elmore as well you know he had called me out and uh my perception on everything is if you can't beat the number one guy then what are you doing in the sport so uh you know they got the number one ranking next to him so I just I think I thought it was the best fight for me because like I said you know I'm, I'm a veteran I've done this for a very long time and I feel like uh not not only proving something to myself but also challenging myself to the highest, uh, you know, as, as elevated as you can get. I mean, if you can't, if you if you beat the number one guy, that puts you in number one. So it was a no brainer. Yeah, for sure. You talk about wanting to get out there and prove something. Like, is that in the form of, I guess, campaigning towards a title? Like you're talking about Elmore being ranked number one at 165 pounds, or is it more of like a get an emphatic victory kind of prove yourself dynamic? Like, what does proving yourself in this fight represent to you? It, it, it's, you know, I, I hold the uh, 165 international title. He's ranked number one. I think uh, uh, being a title holder and holding that number one ranking proves that uh, exactly what I said whenever I came to BKFC, that this was something that was made for guys like me. And, uh, you know, just just what, what I meant by prove yourself is when they put that number one ranking next to your name, it means that you're you're the ranked number one guy in the world, and uh, that that to me is what I set out to do from the very beginning. I always like to uh, try to compete and be the best at anything that I do. So this cements it. You know, it gives me that that uh, that 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 title and that status, and and uh, it, it definitely comes with a lot of weight. And then you know you you got an even bigger target on your back, and I mean. Why would you want to be at the top if you're not worried about the guys coming up from underneath you? So I'd rather be the guy on top waiting for somebody than to be a guy on the bottom hunting for the big guy. And it's an interesting fight, too, because, like, with the backdrop of your, you know, last bout with the Jim Allers go around there that, you know, didn't necessarily go your way. But, like, it's been a while since then. Like, it's been over a year well over a year actually so and like i was saying before quite a student of the game just really taking in the nuances of like the shortened footwork shortened head movement kind of stuff i imagine you're chomping at the bit to get out there and show what is almost even like a new leveled up leonard garcia in bkfc absolutely um you know uh uh when 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 i had uh got signed to bkfc um course you know I, I i run a company now and uh you know i was i was just working full time um four years out of the game you know and i was still kind of training but not really in it and um i took the julian for the lane fight on a uh five week notice um i basically you know walked out of the office went and trained for five weeks and then i went and won that fight and uh that was really a big curse to me because it gave me the uh, the false sense of I don't have to do anything but train for four weeks or five weeks and, and I'll be ready. And uh, like I said, I went out there with Jim and, and, and all the credit to Jim, man. He went out there and he did a fantastic job. He punched me right in the eyeball and uh, it really did a lot of damage. Um, 
and and uh, I mean, he did what a fighter's supposed to do. You find a weakness and, and you go for it. Um, I had no no way of seeing out of that that eye, man. But I know that if you say those words when you're in the corner to a referee or or, or to a judge, if you say I can't see, they're going to stop the fight. Never once did I think about saying I can't see, but I couldn't see out of my left eye. Um, and I have a, a couple pictures where my eyes completely swollen. I got blood all on the on my lashes, and it's very painfully obvious that I can't see. But um, you know, it, it it changed a lot of things for me. It put a lot of things into perspective, and it, it made me realize, um, you know, sitting around and waiting for the next fight or for the next call, and then picking up and starting to train isn't the way to go. So you're exactly right. It changed the nuance. It changed everything else. I became a professional BKFC fighter for a reason. And uh, for that, th- this last year and two months, you know, I've been physically trying to get better. I've bettered my body. I've bettered myself physically and mentally. Um, you know, the, the unfortunate thing about winning is you never learn nothing off of a win other than what you did was good. But you learn so much more from a loss. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for Jim for uh, putting that into perspective for me. And, and uh, like you said, I am definitely chomping at the bit to show people that, uh, that I have been working for this last year and a half. And, uh, you know, I've recovered, uh, uh, you know, did, did everything that I needed to do to be prepared mentally and physically for this fight. So I feel fantastic, and, and uh, I'm ready to get in there and show everybody the, the, the small things that I've been working, but really just to show people that I have been working now. Yeah, that's an interesting timeline you articulated and even compounds interest in a fight that I was already quite excited for. But I think that sentiment that you're talking about can also extend to Joe Elmore there. Like, he seems like he's very respectful of the skills you bring to the table. But there was that quote on the Bare Knuckle TV website there where he was saying, he's a legend, but I believe I'm the legend killer. What are your thoughts on on that there? You know, when you say things uh, building up to a fight, sometimes you say things out of emotion and, and, and you say things that, that you don't necessarily, you don't mean them by disrespect. Um, you know, Joe is a fantastic guy, man. We have a, actually have a really good relationship. And it, it's weird because, you know, we, we, we try to knock people's heads off when we get in there. But, um, you know, I think saying things like that, you know, I, I, I believe, you know, he, he feels like he's the number one guy in the world. And, uh, you know, if he feels he has a right to, to, to say something like that, that's fantastic. Let him say it. Um, unfortunately for him, there's going to be a time to prove it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, my dad used to give this statement a lot, and I, I don't know if it's a good statement to say, but he was like, man, you know, when it's nut gutting time, we, you know, you're going to find out if you're ready to go. So um, I know he's ready to fight, man. And, and uh, you know, after, after making a comment like that, you got to live up to it. So I'm going to do my best to be the legend and not get killed. And uh, he's going to do his best to be the legend killer. So we'll see if the legend uh, lives on or, or, or if he gets killed. But uh, I'm banking on, 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 on being a legend. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, legendary things happen when, when, when things are said. And, I mean, I, I don't take it as a disrespectful quote. I completely understand where his mindset is. And I want him to think he can beat me. Because it's my job to go in there and prove that he can. So, yeah, and that's kind of the vibe I got from it. Like, not a disrespectful thing. Probably a similar sentiment you have, where it's like, "Hey, I, I respect what you bring to the table. You're a good opponent, but I'm going out there to win. Like, I'm going to knuckle up and get to it." Yeah, absolutely, man. I, you know, like I said, we we have tremendous respect for each other, and uh, we we've talked about uh, training together afterwards, and uh, you know. Yeah, lots of different things. I mean, we're 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 uh, we're really two of the guys that, that that won't say no. You know, like if they would have asked me to fight anybody, I would have said okay. You know, I'm ready. And uh, I believe he's the same way. I, I I've never heard of him backing away from a fight. I've never heard of uh, him shying away from anything. So, um, you know, I I think it's the best matchup uh, BKFC could have put together. And and. Uh, like I said, neither one of us uh, have any quit in us, and uh, we don't know how to give up. And, I mean, what two guys would you rather have? You know, if you're paying money to watch two guys fight, Joe Elmore and, uh, of course, myself, 
are, are, are the two guys that, that, that I would actually pay to watch myself fight. So, uh, because I know what I'm bringing to the table. So, so, uh, you know, for the fans, I'm excited. For myself, I'm excited. And for Joe, I'm excited. I, I don't think it was a disrespectful comment. I'm just saying now, now, now it's time for both of us to prove what we say. Absolutely, totally get what you're saying there. And Elmore Knucklepedia's top ranked 165 pound fighter. So that would obviously put you in a great place for sure. But the last bout being at 155 pounds and also you've got a bit of a past at 145 pounds is the sole path going forward just 165 maybe try to get the belt and get some defenses like obviously not overlooking your opponent here but I guess I'm wondering if you have title aspirations across multiple divisions or just kind of go with the one more so you know I I feel really comfortable at 165 it's really close to my when I'm in 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 the, my best physical form I feel fantastic at 170 when I'm just walking around at that weight. And uh, that's when I feel the, my, the most athletic, like my jumping abilities, my reactions, everything feels real good. Like my muscles feel dense at that. I, and I don't feel too heavy, don't feel too light. I feel like that's the perfect uh, uh, optimum weight for me. So to dehydrate that five pounds and then and then gain it, gain it back the next day, um, I, I, I'm, I'm really comfortable at that weight class, and I feel like if I'm going to compete at something and try to be the best at it, you want to be right where you feel like it's your optimum weight, and uh, 165 works beautifully for me. So in the future, I don't have any aspirations to make 155 or 145 ever again, and I really don't want to jump up to 185 so or, or 70, whatever, whatever the next weight class is. So yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's just the perfect weight for my body, my, my frame and my size. And that's where I feel the best. And, um, absolutely. Like I said, I'm, I'm going out there to prove, you know, that that number one spot belongs where, 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 where it needs to be. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out there and, and reach for that goal and, and try to get it. Yeah, I definitely get what you're saying, man. But yeah, just quite a legacy so far in combat sports, like contending for that WEC title and, getting LFA gold at one point. It seems like also the family at this point starting to kind of get more involved in the fold as well a little bit. Like, from what I understand, that was your kid kind of near Nate Diaz during that infamous scene where he was trying to, like, light up the joint cage side. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. That, my, my, uh, that, that was my, my kids right behind Nate whenever that happened. Yeah. Uh, it was a funny story. We get along really well with Nate. We're sitting there with him. Uh, it was funny because that night, uh, Cowboy, who, who's also, you know, a really close family relative, uh, and and uh, uh, Nate's boy, Yancey, they were fighting each other. So we're kind of rivals, but yeah. me and Nate are great friends, man. And we, we, you know, we got to sit there together. My family got to meet him. Nate's a fantastic guy, man. I'd really be eager to see Nate come into Bare Knuckle and do some damage as well. Oh, man, I mean, that would be a pretty wild scenario, just the pace he can push and everything like that. It seems tailor-made for a guy like that. Are there any other MMA fighters that you think could make a seamless transition over or somebody to be interested in? Like you mentioned Diego Sanchez in our past interview. Is there someone in the MMA world you think could also cross over, though? You know, I, I think there's a lot of guys that, that would, uh, it would it would translate well. Um you know, in the, in, in the heavyweight division, to see a, you know a scary guy like Francis Ngannou um, come over to bare knuckle would be—I mean, man, if I was a heavyweight, I'd run for the hills if he yeah. decided to come over to bare knuckle. Uh, Derek Lewis is one of those guys that I think—I mean, I think they're tailor-made for the sport. I think this bare knuckle would be the wave of the future if they could get those big guys to come over. Um, yeah, you know the, the the lightweight guys, man. They, they they really show a lot of promise and a lot of speed, a lot of good technique. But uh, man, heavyweights just like Godzilla and King Kong fight each other, and I think that draws the biggest crowd. I'd really love to see uh, some of the heavyweights come over. But um, you know, as far as far as uh, the the lower guys in my weight class, I had heard that uh, Josh Neer was coming over, mm, okay. and. Um, you know, I, I think he would be a fantastic bare knuckle fighter. I, I I don't know. I think at one point in time they said he had signed, um, but he's one of the guys I'd be nervous about signing against. You know, and I'm fighting a guy like Joe Elmore, so that's saying a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no doubt. It's a uh, it's a curious sport and a lot of options. I mean, Josh Neer would certainly be a guy that I would like to see knuckle up and 
toe the line too. But you've been really great with your time, Leonard, and I appreciate getting to talk to you ahead of this big fight here. But is there anything that you'd like to sort of add as a parting thought as we're kind of wrapping up here, man? Man, I just, you know, like to thank you guys. Of course, you know, first and foremost, man, thank God for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, just, just, just understand, I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's with us in the, a, at every step. Uh, my family, man, for sticking with me and letting me uh, just fulfill a dream. You know, they're, they're, I, I love to compete. I love to fight. And the opportunity to be number one was there. And, and, and they're, they're right behind me and they're giving me that opportunity. So, you know, to them, thank you. And also the fans, man, for uh, for never giving up on me and always knowing, man, that I always go out there and, and I'm going to give you guys a great show. And, uh, you know, just 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 those three things, man. And, uh, of course, all the sponsors, you know, a, a, anybody who uh, who's willing to give me a little bit of money to, to, to flash their logo out there, man, it's a big deal. It really helps out. And, um, I mean, man, just BKFC – for putting this sport together, man. Dave Feldman, you've been fantastic. And, uh, you know, all respect to Joe Elmore, man. Let's go out there and let's, you know, let's do what we say we're going to do, man. I, let, let, let's uh, let the legend live on or let's try to, you know, you could try to kill the legend. Let's see how it goes, buddy. Yeah, I didn't think I could get more excited for this fight, but after talking to you, I think it's even more compounded there. Garcia versus Elmore, top in the marquee for BKFC 16. It goes March 19th. You can check that out on Fight TV. Also, the Bare Knuckle TV app has that available. Joe Elmore and Leonard Garcia toe in the line and knuckling up. Thanks for coming on the show again, Leonard. Much appreciated. And yeah, just best of luck with the rest of your preparations and have a good rest of your day as well, man. Awesome, man. Thank you, sir. You have a great one. All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, we've got quite the card coming up, BKFC 16, and a co-main event feature that was very much catching my eye. We have Reggie Barnett Jr. taking on Demarcus Corley, and I've got Demarcus on the show right now. How are you doing there, man? How's the training and everything going ahead of this one? <laughs> training is going great for me. I'm always training. Uh, I stay ready. I was trying to get a regular boxing match uh, this year and early last year, but I couldn't get no fight, so... I uh, reached out to David uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. I told him I was interested in doing it when E.J. Smith and uh, Paulie had got into it. And um, he said, okay, well, we'll see if we can match you up. And it took almost three years for me to get someone to really commit and fight me. We had um, Travis Thomas. We had, um, uh, who else we had? a legitimate fight, a contract with um, two other guys that I posted them fighting. Yeah, so this has been like an... Yeah. For the fight, it didn't happen. And that was very frustrating to me. So are you confident that this fight is going to materialize then just with, you know, that backdrop of the previous ones not working out? Or do you think Reggie Barnett Jr. is like a game kind of proven competitor and it's going to, you know, go as you want? Reggie's 100% solid, and uh, I appreciate Reggie for uh, accepting to fight me because a lot of other guys didn't want to fight me because of who I am and what I bring to the bare knuckle game. But I know it's a different, it's a different sport. This is not boxing. This is fighting, and uh, I got into boxing just because I love to fight. I got into it just to win trophies at 10 years old. And I realized that boxing is a sport, and it helps you a whole lot become disciplined and teach you how to carry yourself as a young man. And I fell in love with it. Yeah, and it seems like, you know, you've been familiarized with, you know, BKFC for, like you said, just the last few years now. So are you, I guess, familiarized with the immediate field, like, surrounding Barnett there, like the guys like, you know, Johnny Bedford, that win like have you been kind of checking out the field of guys that presumably you'd be looking to toe the line with of course um, I wanted to go straight at um, Johnny Bedford when he was champion before the, um, dad had him and this was two years ago but they were like well you can't come straight in and fight for the world title you have to get a debut and we got to see what you really made of and I was telling um, David and everyone I said Trust me, I'm the real deal when it comes to fighting. I know boxing, and I know how to fight. And uh, he was like, well, we'll see, because 
we just can't put you in there and you go straight for the title. And that's my goal. I'm going to become world champion as a bare knuckle fighter. So presumably the goal would be to compete at 135 pounds and capture that belt. I mean, mostly in your gloved boxing run, it seemed like you were at like 140, large in part. I mean, obviously you deviated from there certain times. So the goal is to capture that world championship at 135 pounds? Oh, 100%. 135. I'm going to defend it maybe two, three times. And, uh, and see who's at 145 pounds at that time. Because, you know, guys, they don't maintain their weight. Um uh, there may be some new guys at 145 pounds that may not be as dangerous as the ones there now. Yeah, well, you articulate the interesting position you're in. Like I said, you fought a lot in glove boxing at 140, but that kind of affords you options on, you know, the weight classes in BKFC that kind of bookend that there. So that's cool that you're looking at, you know, multiple divisions potentially. And just also kind of the way you worded things at the beginning of our interview, I'm kind of curious to ask because it seems like there's goals to also you know compete in gloved boxing again going forward so are you looking to i guess like divvy things up between these two sports here like what's the mindset in that regard truthfully on that aspect once i walk away from boxing i'm going to fall in love with their knuckle fighting and i'm going to fight between three to four fights i'm not going to come back because it's a lot of politics, and it's the promoters and the managers that's running the game of boxing. It's not the fighters no more. Back when I was fighting, fighters fight everyone. You want to fight? Okay, we're going to make this fight happen. Now it's promoters and the managers that have money and invested in their prospects, their fighters, and it's business, and I understand that. I'm not going to put my fighter who's 23 and 1 or 23 and 0 in there with a dangerous fighter who possibly can knock him out in the later rounds. Yeah, every every young fighter always give me the first three, three to four rounds. But I know down the stretch, I'm going to break them down. And we got good 10 to 12 rounds in front of us, I'm going to get them. Yeah, I love the confidence for sure. And I kind of thought to ask this just because, I mean, in gloved boxing, much is made of the utility of sparring and as far as, you know, being able to gauge distance and timing and stuff like that. But obviously, you know, bare knuckle, a hard thing to simulate in a sparring context, just with like the prevalence of cuts and certain things like that. So I'm kind of wondering, like, do you have a certain, I guess, methodology for, you know, supplementing that kind of thing, just like finding the range and timing ahead of this? Or is it kind of just something you largely have to navigate in the competition itself? Um, you didn't tell me my camera wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, this is a navigating that I have to do when I'm in there. But a lot of things that fighters don't understand, it's a tunnel vision. When you're in there fighting, everything is quick. And you're in a tunnel. So you have to be able to see things that move real fast. But you have to be able to slow it down like you're in a NASCAR race. And you're in that tunnel where you can see stuff. It's moving quick, but you have to be able to slow it down and make moves before it happens. Yeah, I get what you're saying on that end there. But, you know, in doing some research on you, I noticed for a few of your past fights there, you had, you know, Jacob Stitch Duran in the corner there. I mentioned the, you know, prevalence of cuts in the sport. Have you gotten to kind of talk to Stitch at all ahead of this BKFC debut or not so much? Not so much. I talked to Stitch earlier last year and the year before when um, I was very interested in going into it when I thought I was going to fight. And uh, Stitch had told me, yeah, Chop, um, I'm, I'm working with them, so I, I most likely I'll be in your corner or the person you fight corner, and I'll be helping you with your cuts. And I said, great, I, I can't wait. But I, I know I have cuts over the years throughout my career of boxing, so I'm not worried about the cuts. There's two things I'm worried about, breaking my hand and getting knocked out. Yeah, I mean, 85 gloved boxing fights. I mean, you've probably seen a fair bit out there, so the worry not there, right? Nah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know the, hand, the hand may get broke, so I got to make sure I place my punches in the right spot, not to break my hand. 
yeah, and I'm kind of wondering just if some of the old, I guess, stylistic hallmarks are going to be coming out for this one, because I know you have the history of, you know, designing your own masks ahead of different entrances and, you know, the all the way down trunks and stuff like that. Can we expect any of that with this BKFC debut? Oh, man. I had, I had one done up for my first bed up fight. It was two years ago. I did an all black. I don't like black. So when I wear all black, I fight a different way. And the, the outfit is pure black, and it has every one of my children's name on my skirt and on my jacket. And it says, I fight for them. And after you say, I fight for them, then it got each one of their names going by age, who's the youngest all the way up to the oldest. And that was my first outfit. And then that fight didn't fall through. And I said, I don't want to wear that now. So I'm going to wear something else. It's going to be flashy. It's a debut, so I got to go all out. So the mindset a little bit different ahead of this one, as compo- or, or as, rather as compared to the pre-navigated kind of timeline. You're looking to tap into a bit of a different kind of energy with this one. This was a is a debut, and it's more exciting. So I I got I got to go with the I got to like this I got to like the crowd up. It's got to be entertainment. It can't be just uh just straight a mean look just coming in to fight this is my debut and i gotta make a statement when i light it up and i'm kind of curious too because i mean you're talking about like wanting those few additional fights and you know certain past efforts like when you were you know circa like 2018 there you were getting ready for like the fifth fight of the year even by like august there like what's the desired strength of schedule in bkfc going forward like you mentioned a certain amount of bouts you'd like to get after you know getting a title you know multiple divisions like what's the i guess overall strength of schedule you would like in 2021 if you have your druthers with it well we got uh march the 19th i would like to go right back uh right after my 47th birthday in june so we're looking at march uh Give me a, a month to recover and heal up my hands and uh, whatever Reggie get me with and my bruises on my face. And uh, go back in June, I'll be 47 years old and uh, do another one sometime towards the fall in September, October. That'll be three fights this year. I'll be world champion. Then uh, 2022 come around. Maybe look at fighting at a higher weight class. Yeah, it seems like you have a like a well mapped out kind of idea of everything. But I'd also seen some past instances whereby you're talking about like getting a clothing line out there and kind of growing things on that end. And I thought there was like a cool backstory with you kind of learning to sew in the home ec class and you became a dressmaker, you know, supporting yourself during an earlier point in the pugilistic efforts there. So how have things been developing with the clothing line? And can you kind of talk about that side of, you know, DeMarcus Corley? Always, always into the fashion and designing. Um, everything I fight, I design. And um, I have a manufacturer company that makes all my shoes, my boxing equipment, uh, my uniform. And um, we're going to continue to do that. I'm working on Chop Chop Kitchen. I'm in the kitchen right now. I'm about to cook some breakfast. I'm 138 pounds, I think, right now. I went to bed at 136, I think. I drank two bottles of water throughout the night. I'm, I'm ready. I'm already at fight weight. So we're working on Chop Chop Kitchen, um, looking to get behind the camera and uh, do some cooking. Yeah, I was noticing that on the Instagram, too, and I think that makes a whole lot of sense. But in talking about that nickname there, because I'd seen an older fight there talking about the nickname origin where you were 65 pounds as an amateur and then I guess ballooned up to 75 after a big meal and then the trainer said you should chop chop your food is that the backstory like did, did those announcers have that correct there yes that's that's pretty much it um weighing 65 pounds it was the national silver gloves we was in nashville tennessee uh we got there and we all checked our weight and i was right on the nose 65 pounds and you know if you eat a salad and drink some water you're pretty much only going to put on a pound or less um, but we went to Burger King, and back then Burger King used to have the salad bar. So I had a salad, but I had uh, a sundae, a banana split, and some burgers and fries, and 
At 10 years old, I went from 65 pounds to 75 pounds overnight. <laughs> and my trainer said, my trainer said, what did you eat? I said, I had a salad. He said, what else? I said, uh, some french fries, a burger, a Sunday, a Frosty. He said, I told you to eat light. You ate out of sight. <laughs> he said, uh, "He said I'm gonna call you Chop Chop. Now you got to move up in weight." So I moved up to 75 pounds, and I fought Danny Ramirez in the championship. I never forget that he became a Hall of Fame boxer. And ever since then, Chop Chop has been the name, and we developed the logo to go with my name, Chop Chop. Yeah, well, I love it. It's such a you know fun backstory and stuff like that. But you touched on something there, just with like the Hall of Fame opposition that you've taken on throughout your career and one of those big names obviously being Floyd Mayweather and I think there's a lot of polarizing opinion nowadays about the exhibition kind of bouts that he's doing like when he fought Tenshin Nasukawa for Ryzen in Japan and you know purportedly fighting Logan Paul later on in the year do you have any kind of thought or feeling on you know Mayweather taking these exhibition bouts or anything like that I look at it and I say Mayweather has took boxing and the sport to another level because it's not just boxing no more. It's entertainment now. And due to the pandemic of the world that we're in right now, we need some type of entertainment because there isn't no more fights pretty much because no audience can attend the boxing matches. The big celebrities can't come out and entertain and watch the fight. So they have to put something together for us to be watched on TV. Yeah, for sure. And I think those bouts definitely get the attention and everything like that. And yeah, I mean, I think they're fun for what they are. I mean, like they're labeled exhibitions and I think it's pretty obvious going in. Like I think if it was, you know, promoted as something different, then maybe the flack could make sense. But I think it's pretty obvious. Like it's just for a bit of fun. Yeah. But you're not oriented to that. You're more still looking to kind of like compete actively and get out there. Like would a, I guess a future potentially way down the line in like an exhibition kind of capacity and certain entertainment minded bouts draw your interest or not so much? Yeah, yeah, I would like to do one with um, Cuban Gooding Jr. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I would like to move around with him. He's one of my favorite actors. And um, it would be an honor just to box him and move around. Is there any particular reason for that? Like, did you see any, like, kind of sparring video of him putting out there or something like that? Or just more so the fandom of his acting, I guess? Just seeing him perform in movies, how, how he articulate and he carry himself like, and when he played in a movie on the ship, uh, what's the name of that movie? Uh, and he had to wear that submarine suit, how, how he really wanted to become a, a scuba diver. Oh, okay, I'm admittedly not familiar with the title offhand, but I mean, I'm a fan of Cuba Gooding in general, good actor. Yeah. Yeah, that would definitely be an interesting sort of thing, no doubt, man, but I'm kind of curious, I usually ask fighters when I have them on the show if there's any kind of like music there, you know, partial to training to, like, are there any artists or songs or genres that get you particularly fired up or kind of whoever grabs the aux cord when you're training, you're fine with whatever plays kind of deal? Real, real boxers understand boxing is an art and a science, and it's all about music because it's rhythm and timing. And when I'm in there, anyone would tell you, if Chop Chop got on some music, it's Odie but Goodies, James Brown, uh, Marvin Gaye, Frankie Beverly, and Maze. I like old music with rhythm, and I get them to my rhythm, and I actually spar and I train. And the music be on, and I get in a rhythm, they be like, uh-oh, he just found his rhythm. And they be like, yeah. And I punch with the music. Those are great artists, though. I mean, I totally understand the utility and everything like that, just getting the timing and kind of getting in a rhythm and undulating with that. So that's cool, man. Thank you. I'm also kind of intrigued about just, you know, the methodology leading into this one, because I've talked to, you know, certain fighters who are transitioning into, you know, bare knuckle boxing there, and then they kind of take on some of the old, like, Broughton's rules, like hand strengthening kind of techniques, and certain exercises in that regard, like the gripping the sand, that kind of stuff. Like, have you been doing any of the old school, like, Broughton's rules, hand strengthening kind of techniques, or not so much of that? 
Yeah, last year I was um punching the sand. I had a bucket, and um we were punching the sand. I had the fight scheduled for August, and we were punching the sand, and my hands were getting raw, and I was like, man, when am I going to get the contract? And never got the contract, so I took time off, stopped punching the sand, and then uh, we were scheduled to do something in October, so I got the Muay Thai wall. It's a board that you mount on the wall, and I started punching that. And it has a cloth on the board. And my hand started bleeding from punching it. And I, put, I saw the video I posted on Instagram. I was working on my right hook because everyone knows I'm a hooker. And I have so much power in my right hand. But I am left-handed. And I was mounted the thing on the wall. And I was working on my hook. And I only do four to three to four and I caved the wall in with the wall mount mounted onto it. Yeah, that's a that's a curious thought with the backdrop of, you know, you getting ready to punch an opponent with the bare fist there. I think that's going to, you know, add a little bit of gasoline to a fire that's already, you know, pretty bright out here. A lot of people, myself included, very excited about this fight and everything. But I want to be mindful of your time, man. I don't want to, you know, take up your whole afternoon, even though... <laughs> I got the day off from the gym. I'm going in the gym later on today just to punch the wall. No boxing. I'm just going to just work on punching the wall and stripping up my knuckles now. Well, I love just hearing the different nuances you're, you know, adding to this one leading into the fight. It's just like I said, cool with the backdrop of you having over 80, close to 90 gloved boxing bouts, the wealth of amateur <laughs> experience and everything. Is there <laughs> I'm laughing because I think back over the years when I got into boxing, and I was just a little kid, and I'm like, I'm a boxer. And as I got older, I'm an amateur boxer, I'm traveling, and I never thought I would be a professional boxer until I got maybe like 19 to 20 something years old, when I really started seeing older guys fighting in the Olympics, and I'm like, I could, I could try to make it to the Olympics one day. So 1992 came around. I was training, getting ready. I lost in the Eastern Trials, and I lost to a guy named Julian Willer. He was from Fort Brad, North Carolina, and it was in the championship. I would have fought much harder if they would have told me, if you win, you're going to Barcelona. So I just went out there. I didn't take it serious. I was just boxing. If I won, I won. If I lost, I lost. When I lost in the championship, the Easter trials, a few months later, he's fighting Oscar in 92 Barcelona. Yeah. That was a revelation wake-up call for me. I sat there and I watched that fight on TV and I was like, I was in the championship and I lost. I was one fight from going to the Olympics. So 1993, 1994, I stopped boxing. I took off. I didn't box for a whole two years. I just gathered my thoughts, and I wanted to be a kid and just play and enjoy myself. I came back in 1995. I had 36 amateur fights. I won 30 out of 36. I went to... Um, the Olympic Festival, and that's when I fought Fernando Vargas. Uh, I won the National Golden Gloves that year. And um, after that, I seen how politics was because me and Fernando, we fought a great fight. I gave him the fight, but the scoring, the way they scored the fight was 19 to 5 after three rounds, and I threw more than five punches, and I land more than five. And they scored him 19. I only landed five. Like, it's politics, and he was already connected with Lou. Lou Duve at that time, he was scheduled to go to the Olympics in 96. So after I lost the trial with Fernando, I said, I'm turning pro. Yeah, that's interesting. You talk about the, you know, time you had off from the sport after, you know, the Olympic trials there and just the utility it seemed to have for your career. And also I'm noticing your fight with Custio Clayton was, you know, a couple of years ago. Now it's been a little bit since then. Do you think there's going to be a similar level of, I guess, utility in as far as like, you know, taking that period of time, just 
like, reframing certain things and then just getting back out there and there's this like revitalized kind of presence out there like do you think there's going to be a similar dynamic with this upcoming bkfc fight and i guess just getting the utility from the time off no not at all um that clayton fight i fought in canada i took the fight um i knew i couldn't make the weight it was 147 pounds i didn't weigh 147 pounds but fighters know how to make them make themselves go up and wait and um i had on clothes i didn't get on the scale I didn't get on the scale with my clothes off, so I weighed probably 144, 43 pounds with my clothes on. Yeah. And um, we took the fight for the money, and uh, it was all, I love the fight at the end of the day. And um, I knew I could outbox him, but um, he was just too big for me in the later rounds. And when I got knocked down with that shot, I said uh, I had enough. I, I live the fight again. I win another fight after this, so I didn't get done. I could have continued, but just being smart and being in there with someone much bigger, and you know he's much bigger than you, why go through that trouble of getting hurt? And I've done that before with Freddie Hernandez when I fought on Showtime. It was scheduled for 10 rounds, and that was at 147 pounds again. I was boxing Freddie. I was winning the first four rounds. Freddie caught me with that overhand right in the fifth round. I went down. I shook my head. I said, damn, that sucker caught me. <laughs> I, said, I said, I got five more rounds to go. Yeah, I can box and try to survive, but he may catch me again. So to avoid getting hurt, I stayed down. Yeah, I mean, just shows the veteran savvy. I mean, no sense in, yeah, keeping going if you're in a compromised spot with, like you said, a guy that is a fair bit bigger and everything like that but yeah i'm just kind of you touched on something there too because you talk about how you just you still have the love for getting out there and competing and fighting like is there anything you do to like keep the flame lit as it were like how is there still this you know desire to get out there and compete when maybe some of your compatriots have decided to kind of hang up the gloves a while ago there's a, there's a couple of reasons one the love that i have for the sport you can't play boxing you can play a lot of other sports, but this, you have to be dedicated and serious about it. And a lot of people see my work ethic and they see how I post on Instagram and Facebook. I stay in the gym, I stay working, I stay ready. And that's another reason why a lot of fighters, managers won't take a chance at me. They like, they see what you're doing. No one is going to fight you. Even though you are, they say, oh, there's a chance you can upset their fighter. And so everyone tells me, you should stop posting your workouts and showing what you're doing with your ab wheel. I'm about to be 47 years old. I still can do the ab wheel standing up 10 times straight. And I'm like, why, why stop showing what I'm able to do at my age? I just don't understand that. It's going to jeopardize you not getting a fight. If they're afraid to fight a guy that's 47 years old and... You can't prove that you can dog me completely, shoot a shit out. These young fighters, Devin Haney, he can't shut me out. Tank Davis can't knock me out. Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Garcia, he can't do shit with me. These young guys at 35, they haven't fought an A-class fighter. They fighting these young fighters who are on the level that they are on. And that's why I can't get a fight with these big guys and the promoters know it. Well, that's interesting because I've seen certain gloved boxers transition into, you know, bare knuckle for similar reasons. Like Nico Hernandez had a past interview where he was talking about how refreshing it was to get away from, you know, the politics that can be associated with gloved boxing that you're talking about. But he was saying that really not the same kind of thing in bare knuckle. There's a greater chance for that upward mobility and getting the kind of matchups you want to really test yourself at that elite level. Do you share that sentiment as well? No. Not really because um, there are not too many big names at 135 pounds. Once I run through the 35 division, the next question is, Chop, what do you think about going to 145? And there's a chance I'm, I'm going to go to 145, but it has to be worth it at the end of the day. 
yeah, well, it seems like you have a ton of options available to you, man. And it was great getting to talk to you ahead of this, you know, BKFC debut. I'm kind of curious, though, if there's anything you'd like to sort of add as a parting thought as we're wrapping up here, man. <laughs> I'm excited. I mean, <laughs> when I say I'm excited, I mean, I'm really excited because I really think this is going to happen. I mean, I was excited when I seen me and Travis Thomas on a poster and we were scheduled to fight October the 16th last year. I was excited back then. And, but not like this. Reggie, Reggie, Reggie Barnett, I know he's going to come to fight. So I ain't got to worry about that. And I know it's 100% he's willing to fight me. So he's not going to pull out. Uh, I know he's going to take care of his body so no injuries will come about. So the fight will be delayed enough, and, and then they gotta find me another opponent, and that's gonna be the problem if something happened, and now we gotta find Chop Chop another opponent within ten days before the fight, and then it'll be a set down again. That's gonna really fuck with me if um something happened with Reggie, and I gotta switch opponents. It don't matter who I fight, but just knowing that Reggie's a solid fighter and he's willing to step up and fight me. That's good. I mean, absolutely, yeah. A guy who is five and one on the BKFC circuit now, and you know, a former title contender, and the only loss came in that title bid against Johnny Bedford. So definitely a game proven guy, and a great way to you know interject yourself into the talent pool right away. It seems. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> well, honestly, man, after. T- Honestly, man, after talking to you, like, I'm even more excited. Like, the excitement was there seeing the announcement, but compounded that much further just hearing how focused you are. And people can check that out. BKFC 16, a co-main event feature between Reggie Barnett Jr. and Demarcus Chop Chop Corley knuckling up and toeing the line for the first time. Really appreciate you making some time and giving me the insights, man. It was a lot of fun and great getting to pick the brain and just looking forward to you know, checking out the fight here. Best of luck in the remaining part of the preparations, and enjoy your day, too. Thanks, Sue. I appreciate it.